If someone doesn't have a smile, give them yours. A lady did that for a man who had never received a smile or a handshake. She did both, and it moved him profoundly. We're going to talk about that today. Pastor Mark Hensley here from the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church here in Colorado Springs. want to welcome you wherever you're watching from. Let us know, and uh, if you have prayer requests, put those in the box below. And then also share this with your friends. And uh, just thank you for watching today. We don't take your presence lightly. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for everyone who's watching. Thank you for how you're going to speak to all of our hearts today. Thank you for how you interacted with people and loved people that many would just uh, turn away from. Remind us to love like that in this world. Lord, we pray for our world. We pray for our president and the incoming president. We pray that somehow, some way, you could create a genuine kindness and uh, empathy across uh, political boundaries and that we can work together and move together as American citizens. We commit this service to you. Pray for those who are going through difficulty of any kind, that they'd feel your comfort, <clears throat> they'd feel your nearness, and they'd feel the assurance that because you live, we live also. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be here today. And thank you for my friends and guests who are watching from around uh, the country. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, he was born on August 5th, back in 1862 in Leicester, England, Joseph Carey Merrick. You'll find it interesting that he was born with no deformities. In fact, he grew up with his brother and sister. And then as he got a little bit uh, into childhood, lumps, <clears throat> initially three small lumps and bumps started appearing on the left side of his body then an enlarged bony lump appeared on his forehead and it grew and then his lips became so enlarged that it made speech quite a challenge. As he continued to grow, noticeable changes in his body continued and his left, <clears throat> pardon me, and uh, his left arm is, uh, looked somewhat normal. Right arm appeared uh, to be uh, affected as you can see and it's just a tragic case that you probably could be familiar with. A London surgeon by the name of Dr. Frederick Trevis happened to meet him at what was billed a human circus. He was billed as the elephant man at that human circus, suggesting he was half man, half elephant. He, the doctor anyway, was unable to communicate with him, so he gave him a card and it was the same card that was found in his possession when he was huddled in an intolerable state of duress and sorrow and brokenness in a train station in London. And the policeman found the card, called the doctor, or reached out to the doctor, I should say. Uh, this is pre-phones, so they got a hold of the doctor somehow. He came and he picked up Joseph Merrick, and what he did is he took him to the London hospital and he stayed there until his death at the age of 27. Shortly after he arrived at the hospital, the doctor had an orderly take him some food to eat, but he didn't brief the orderly on Merrick's appearance. And, uh, and by the way, his name, some say his name was Joseph, some say John. I tend to always remember it as John. But um, this orderly took the food in and was so startled by his appearance that he dropped the tray and screamed and ran out of the room. One day, Dr. Travis arranged to have a woman take him his food and to make sure that when she did, she would smile at him and then to shake his hand. And that's what she did. Can you imagine? She walks into his room not troubled by his appearance because she had been briefed, but she smiled at him, wished him a good morning and shook his hand. The effect that had on John Merrick was not quite what the doctor expected. And I quote, as he let go of her hand, he bent his head on his knees and he cried 
until I thought he couldn't cry anymore, and I thought he would never quit crying. He told me afterwards, and this is John Merrick, that this was the first woman who had ever smiled at him and the first woman in his whole life that had shaken hands with him. In their short time together, Dr. Travis would take Merrick out to the countryside where he could hear the birds sing and, and see, the, uh, see the butterflies and, and experience nature at its finest. And he said, by painstakingly listening to him, he found out he was a very intelligent man and he was very articulate. He had a deep love for scripture. He loved the word of God. And he said to him, when he eulogized him, remember, he died at the age of 27. He said he had never heard him complain. Isn't it amazing? The effect of a smile and a handshake on this man. I think about that and I think about human kindness and how impactful it is. And the other side of that is how disruptive is hatred and vitriol and unkindness. And sometimes we, even as believers, draw conclusions about others and about their opinions without really getting to know them, without really dialoguing, without really listening to one another. Discernment is so needed today in every sphere of life. And there will be times, however, and you must listen to me, that we have to be direct and we have to be dogmatic in dealing with those in the text that we're in today in the series through the book of Jude, when we engage with people who willfully come into the church to disrupt the church. And they are coming, they have come, and they will come. And I want to talk about that today, the second message in the series through the book of Jude, Contending for the Faith. We're in Jude chapter 1 today, verses 3 through 4. Jude chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for condemnation. This condemnation, he said, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master, <clears throat> pardon me, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Contending for the faith means... Sometimes there's an essential change of thought. You'll see it in the text. Jude wanted to write about salvation, about the, the amazing way that God reaches out to us and claims us as his own. But the Holy Spirit gave him a detour, and he writes about it, a literary detour. You'll see it in the text. Sometimes in your own journey, God will send you in a new direction, and we need to be aware of that when he does that. The second point in the message today is problem people will show up. That's a promise. And then finally, we'll notice today, we have things we need to be aware of, what to be aware of. And what is it about God's word and the truth of God's word that should be so much a part of our DNA that we do not compromise, even though compromise is suggested by a watching world. Well, we're going to look at that today. So under that title, Contending for the Faith, we're in the book of Jude, chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Notice, first of all, Jude has this essential change of thought. You know, the Lord at any moment can create a, a detour, a, a redirection. I remember so many times when, when we were first learning to navigate with our cell phones and, and you'd miss a turn and they'd say, recalculating, recalculating. One time, Laura and I were in San Diego and I, I have to believe that the temperature in heaven must be the same as it is in San Diego. Almost any time you look, any time in the, the year, it's 70 degrees. That is a beautiful place. The climate's ideal. But I remember we were uh, asking for directions. We had done it in advance and so... Uh, Siri was, or whoever it was, was directing us on our, on our phones. 
And all of a sudden she said, take the next right now. <laughs> we had to go right. Whoo, it was quick. That actually happened to us uh, this past Saturday on the way to Denver. Uh, we were, uh, but it wasn't Siri's fault on that one. We just asked her too late about how to get to a restaurant. And she said, take exit 88, if I remember right. And there it was. It was almost just like reminiscing when we were in San Diego. We took that off ramp just in time. Well, the point is, is sometimes we are going this way and God says, I want you to go that way. That's what happens to Jude. He has decided under the direction and inspiration of the Holy Spirit to kind of shift direction. And so he does. He's experiencing a detour of thought. And notice what he writes, beloved. He's writing to God's people. We are beloved. We're loved by God. And uh, we're to love one another. But he says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was for once all delivered to the saints. It's interesting. He said, I find it necessary to write appealing to you. Jude uses a word that means to urge. It's a strong word. It's, it's uh, compelling. It means to beseech. Jude was simply stating, you've got to contend for the faith. You don't have an option. You've got to know what you believe and stand up for what you believe in. That word translated contend, you'll find it interesting. It's an athletic term. It's used for athletes that strain and work and stretch to achieve and to acquire what they are aiming for, which is first place. And they're focused on that. They're determined on that. And uh, I remember growing up here in this city, and I, I wanted, I aspired to be a, a, an athlete, but I was just average, if that. But I was surrounded by some extraordinary athletes. Uh, my childhood friend who still lives in town, Dennis Rogan, was the best athlete I've ever seen. And uh, he went on to have uh, tremendous success in, in high school. We played high school football together. He played, I watched, I cheered. Uh, they let me in if they got the score up high enough. But he went on to uh, have a full ride to the University of Nebraska and then translated to, uh, transferred I should say to Weber State College and then was, uh, he, he signed with uh, the Chicago Bears, was the last cut of the Chicago Bears in August back in 1984, so I'm dating myself, but he was such an athlete. And I remember so much, and you know, back in the day, elementary schools in Colorado Springs, at the end of school in the spring, many of you will remember this, that have, that have field day. We love field day. You could eat licorice and nachos and whatever you could bring and buy, but they'd have field events. You'd throw the softball, you'd run relay races. And I'll never forget, Dennis, Every ribbon he had was a blue ribbon. You know what blue meant? First place, first place, first place. And I remember so well my ribbons. I had a white ribbon, <laughs> white ribbons third place. And that was in the softball throw. I was third, he was first. I had a red ribbon and I think it's because I was on his team for a relay or something. And the blue one, I don't know how I got it, but I must've been attached to him, maybe in the uh, three-legged race or something, I don't know. But athletes, pristine, great athletes and average athletes always strive to succeed. And so the, the term here is an athletic term. And so Jude wants us to wrestle with that and, and not push away, not hesitate to exert ourselves in being vigilant to those who would infiltrate the church with false doctrine or with a willful desire to disrupt the unity in the body. And sometimes that happens in the church. So Jude, is, he just doesn't mince any words. I'm changing my sermon title, he says, because the Holy Spirit of God is urging me as I urge you in this new focus of thought. A call here to defend the faith necessitates a faith to be defended and in turn requires that we know what our faith is about. And we need to know who we believe in and know the word of God. We know the faith once delivered for all the saints, the Bible says. It's a fixed set of truths. We'll see that in a little bit. 
we don't change it, we don't tamper with it, we don't modify it for the culture. We simply proclaim it and defend it. And uh, that's what uh, Rex Arendale, Presbyterian pastor in Houston, said. I like what Rex said. He's saying, you have to possess that faith, be possessed by Christ. And it's in Christ in us that's a hope of glory. And then there are certain inalienable tenets of the faith in the Word of God that are not open for debate. Sometimes we're not only to be dogmatic, we're supposed to be bulldog dogmatic <laughs> about what we believe. And we'll see that in the text a little bit later. But uh, here's the reason. Uh, Jude says this to us. If you stand on the word in this culture, and if that was true 2,000 years ago, folks, you know how true it is today? When you and I declare the truth of God's word, there's only one way to heaven. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. The man's goodness does not bring about the righteousness of God. That we believe in the virgin birth and the deity of Christ. We believe it's one man, one woman is what marriage is comprised of. When you make a definitive statement like that, you might be taken off some social network. But you have to stand on the truth. And folks, I will stand on the truth to my last breath. And the truth of God's word. I tell you, the, the word of God is an anchor in a storm, isn't it? I thank God for his word. I do. I don't know what I would do without it. It comforts me when I'm down. It assures me when I'm uncertain. It provides guidance and it's a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. And it reminds me, because remember, two thirds of this word, 66 books, is the Lord Jesus is coming back. And we proclaim that. We proclaim that he's going to come back and take over. This world belongs to him. In the book of Revelation, you wonder what is this world coming to? Well, ultimately, it's going to come to the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ because the kingdom of this world and of his son are the, becoming the kingdoms of his Christ. You see that in the book of Revelation. So Jude is emphatic, and we ought to be too, and we ought to stand on what we believe, but you got to know what you believe, and you better get ready because if you teach the truth and preach the truth, you've got some difficult people are coming your way, problem people will show up. Notice verse 4. For certain people, he says, have crept in unnoticed, sliding in through a side door is how I think of it, sneaking across the border, kind of worming their way in through the back door. These spiritual deceivers find their way into our Christian communities all the time. I liked how the NLT put it. I say this, he's quoting this in, in the New uh, Living Translation. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into our churches. And here's what their message was. Listen to this. Saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago for they have denied our only master and Lord, him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what Jude says is the problem then. By the way, Jude was written probably between 60 and 80 AD. So it took the church uh, 60, 50, 60 years to really develop uh, some roots in the soil of that world. And churches were growing and people were getting saved. And inevitably the enemy of our soul, Satan, was trying to stealthily sent in false teachers to divide and destroy the fellowship. And so Jude says, you know, I'd love to have written about salvation. I'd love to just pulled out uh, some thoughts and inspired by the Holy Spirit of how incredible it is to be claimed by the Lord Jesus Christ and to be adopted into his forever family. But I can't do it today. <clears throat> I can't do it today. I have to talk about the people who are coming who might be disruptive and with stealth-like cunning planning will infiltrate the church and cause trouble in your fellowship. These ungodly men had crept in among the Christians and he's putting us on alert in 2021. It's critically important for us to know what it means because it's still happening today. You say, how so, Pastor? <clears throat> Folks, excuse me, have you ever heard... Someone say this. Well, don't worry so much about sin. 
Don't be so uptight about biblical authority or following the scriptures. Relax. You're covered by the grace of God. And some people just have such a cavalier notion of the word of God that you can just kind of pick and choose what you believe about it. And sometimes they'll say something sanctimonious like this. Well, all religions lead to God. Really? If you had an ailment that needed to be treated by your doctor and he said to you and he came in, he charged you $100 and he said, you know what? My medicine cabinet's just right over there. Just grab something and, I, and we'll see how it works out for you. What would you think of your doctor? You'd say, doctor, you need a doctor. <laughs> you need some observation. <clears throat> Folks, when you have a specific, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> when you have a specific need in your life, it has to be met specifically by what you need. Uh, last week, I guess it was about a week ago, I had to have a cataract removed. And did you know everybody gets cataracts eventually? Did you know babies can be born with cataracts? One thing that, that happens, and Laura will tell you this is true of her husband. If I have something like that happen, I will dive deep into the history of cataracts, the, in, you know, how they deal with them, what the prognosis is, what, diff, what are the different lenses, what does this mean, what is... I drive Laura crazy because I'm so curious. I've always been that way. <clears throat> but I went to see a doctor here in town, highly recommended. Had done my mother's cataracts and uh, such an organized office. And they knew exactly what they were doing. And they measured my eye precisely. And some of you are Facebook friends of mine. They put orange dot over the eye that needed treatment. Folks, I don't know how many times those people asked me, what's your name? What's your date of birth? And which eye are we working on? That place, they were precise. And can I tell you, it was a wonderful success. I can see better than I've seen in a long time. Because I went to a doctor who prescribed my treatment and gave it to me specifically. It's so true it is of the word of God. You can't pick and choose what you'll believe. Trust in the Lord. Believe in his word but also know it so well that you can recognize false teaching when it is infiltrates into your life. And people try to tell you so many things that uh, sound good on the outset, but they don't have their source or their foundation in the word of God. The idea <clears throat> in the context is they were suggesting there's no moral absolutes. Since you've been forgiven, live any way you want to. When a so-called believer lives a life like that, we are rightly described as hypocrites, mask wearers, having a face this way and that way, depending on who's watching. Someone said character is what you are in the dark. But sometimes... We just don't want to tell people who we really are, or we want them to have a different impression of us. I remember a story of a little boy who, out in the back of his country home, found a rat. And he killed the rat, and he was bringing that rat into his mama's house to show her what he had accomplished. And he told her, said, Mama, I hit that rat with a board three or four times, and then I kicked that rat, and I stomped that rat, and that rat... And all of a sudden, he noticed that the pastor of the church was visiting his mama and sitting on the couch. And he put that rat behind himself, and he said, and then the Lord called him home, mama. <laughs> That's what happened. Sometimes we're hypocritical. Uh, sometimes we want to give the impression that we're a certain way. And the wisdom and the understanding of the text is sometimes the greatest battles that we fight are in the silent chambers, someone said, of our own souls. And we need to ask ourselves, don't we? Am I willing to be a person of total integrity? Am I willing to apologize when I make mistakes, to love unconditionally, to value someone else's happiness as, as much as I do my own? Jude is saying, I wish I could write to you about salvation. It's such an incredible subject, but I can't. Because in your church, people have come in 
stealthily to disrupt with false narratives and suggestions that you don't have to believe in moral absolutes, much less be held accountable by this word of God. And he's saying those people are not to be trusted. We're talking about how at times there'll be an essential change of thought, like there was for Jude when he changed his focus in his message. Problem people will show up. You'll find wolves in sheep's clothing in your Christian journey. Sometimes it will baffle you how people can act that way. But folks, just stay close to the Lord and realize that it was prophesied in Jude, and it's true in the church today. Always, always be on alert, Jude would say to us. And then you, find, you notice finally, how do we deny the Lord? We deny the Lord by not being aware. Basically, what should we be aware of? And Jude tells us. Verse 4, for certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Their character. Jude says, uh, uses the word ungodly. Do you know six times in the 25 verses in the book of Jude, he uses the word ungodly? There's a real problem. It's a real problem then. It's a real problem now. And of course, uh, he, he doesn't mince any words. He talks about sensuality. Basically, the idea of sexual impropriety under the guise that it's okay uh, and you, you just can accept it. Well, I want to remind you that in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 4, the Bible says that the marriage bed is undefiled. Basically, Intimacy with another person is a wonderful gift of God within the bonds of marriage. And folks, honestly, if you have intimacy uh, with someone else and you're married, that's adultery. If you're intimate with someone else that's not your spouse, that's fornication. And the Bible does not support sexual lasciviousness. It just doesn't. In fact, these people were taking the grace of God and the goodness of God and the free gift of salvation and they were using it as an occasion to sin. That's what the Word of God says. It's talking about fleshly, sexual misconduct, drunkenness, gluttony, all kinds of uh, attitudes and willful embracing of sin that the Word of God prohibits. These are persons who receive the truth, rejected the truth, ridicule the truth, and now they attempt to replace the truth. <clears throat> Folks, that's not going to happen in churches where people are full of the Holy Spirit and who know the Word of God, because false teaching will sound like it. And you'll realize God never contradicts His Word. So if you're suggesting that I can do something untoward that's forbidden in the Word, uh, Either God's lying or you're lying, and God doesn't lie. I liked what Danny Aiken said. He's the president of Southeastern Seminary in Wake Forest, North Carolina. He said, I believe there are 12 non-negotiables to which Scripture and the history of the church gives eloquent witness. And I want you to listen to these. And I want to ask you a question. Do you believe them? Do you live them out? Are they a part of the DNA of your Christian life? Listen. Number one, the inerrancy and the infallibility of the Scripture. This is God's Word. It's God's message to a fallen world. You can trust it. It's completely trustworthy. What about the full and eternal deity of Christ? Do you believe that Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man and He's the only way to heaven? Do you believe in the miraculous virgin birth and the sinless life of our Lord? Do you believe in the historic creation of man and women made in God's image? Do you believe in the sanctity of life from conception to natural death? Do you believe in the sacredness of marriage between a man and a woman? Do you believe in the sinfulness of all human people? All of us, all the whole human race. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Do you believe it? I do. Do you believe 
in the substitutionary death of Christ for sinners that Jesus died for us. God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Do you believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave? Do you believe that he rose from the dead? Triumphant? Victorious? Do you believe that he ascended to the right hand of the Father where he ever liveth to make intercession for us? He prays for us. Do you believe that he's alive? Do you believe he rose from the dead? Paul did. If Christ be not raised, you are yet in your sins and your faith is futile. <clears throat> the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, Gary Habermas said, who's a professor at uh, Liberty Theological Seminary, is a rock on which Christianity rests on because he lives. We live also. So the question I'd ask you in the 12 that Dr. Aiken gives us today, these absolutes of the word of God, do you believe in the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you believe in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? I do. <clears throat> I Folks, I wouldn't trust the best 15 minutes of my life to get me to heaven. <laughs> I wouldn't. I'm saved because in a day in North Carolina, I repented of sin and I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life. He keeps his word. He changed my life and I was a new creature. I haven't gotten over it since. Do you believe in the exclusivity of the gospel for Jesus Christ for sinners? There's no other way given among men whereby we must, must be saved. Do you believe that? I do. Do you believe in the return of Christ? Oh, even so come Lord Jesus and the assignment of all people. And this is stern, but it's the gospel truth. If you believe the word of God, do you believe in the return of Christ and the assignment of all people either to eternal blessedness in heaven or eternal condemnation in hell? Do you believe that? I'm telling you on the authority of the word of God, there are moral ethical absolutes from the beginning of Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation 22 that are not open for debate. A Christian is to believe the word of God, the whole counsel of God. And if you do, and if you will, and if you will not be silent about it, if you'll be de declaring the whole counsel of God, I promise you, you'll have some challenging days ahead for you. But stand true, stand strong, and stand faithful. To your Lord, come what may. We've been talking today about contending, contending for the faith. And it means an essential change of thought. It means problem people will come. And what we need to be aware of. Can I ask you, are you saved? I mean, can you absolutely look to a time when the Lord Jesus Christ came into your life? I can and are you trusting him now? So many times we look back to what he's done, but I, I tell you, are you trusting him now? Is the Holy Spirit of God in your heart right now a bright living reality? Have you been saved? You say, Pastor, what does that mean? That sounds like a churchy word. It means to be rescued. It means to be forgiven. It means to have a new standing. Uh, think of yourself as floating around in an aimless sea tossed by the waves and all of a sudden a life preserver comes your way and you grab it. Well, the life preserver is the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's his promise to you. It's his promise to us. Have you given him your life? If you haven't, pray a prayer like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you're who you said you are, that you're God in the flesh, that you were tempted in all ways like human beings are, but without sin. And I ask you to change my life today. And folks, if you are saved, thank God that he saved you. Thank God, Lord, thank you for saving the people who are watching, who've made that decision. Draw those who haven't to you. Let them humbly bow in your presence and ask you to transform their lives. And I'd ask that you'd save everyone watching and everyone who will watch in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in a match. We're in a battle for sure. We're in a contest. 
And sometimes we don't want to participate. We'd rather stay on the bench. But uh, folks, risk and effort is worth it when you're serving God and you're serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who loves you deeply, but also will place you as he's placed me. Sometimes in harrowing situations where all I had was him and I found out that's all I needed. I hope that you will contend for the faith to your last breath. And then at last we shall behold him then face to face. Pastor Mark Kinsley from the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church here in Colorado Springs, hoping that you have a wonderful, restful afternoon. Let us know where you're from. Let us know how we can pray for you. And remember how deeply you are loved. Bye, folks. <music>